All right, everyone, welcome back. Now, today we will be looking at uh, studies in nationalism again, sociology of nationalism, and particularly the book Nations by Azar Gat. Now, Gat is an Israeli uh, historian, academic. I think he mainly studies military history and strategy. But he wrote this interesting book, Nations, which uh, brings him into this debate around nationalism that I've covered previously in this channel. We looked at Walker Connor, who is a modernist theorist. Uh, we looked at Adrian Hastings and his arguments that nationalism predates modernity, uh, that it originates in the medieval period, uh, and that England was basically the first nation state um and he would be more of kind of a i guess what would we call like an ethno symbolist uh, so these are kind of the the camps you would have the the modernist people like hobsbawm gilner that argue that nationalism is this distinctly modern phenomenon that emerged with industrialization it was the result of elite manipulation uh it's a temporary phenomenon it doesn't really have a, a strong basis the ethno symbolists like anthony smith weighed in and said actually uh, this analysis is missing the key component of ethnicity and you can't really understand the origin of nations or why nationalism was powerful in the first place unless you bring ethnicity into it. Uh, but the ethno symbolist would still say that yes, nationalism as a political phenomenon is absolutely modern, even if uh, ethnicities preceded that. Um, so they're kind of a, a middle position. And then you have primordialism, which says that some form of nationalism has been around for uh, as long as states have been around, as long as people have been organizing, there's been some kind of primitive form of nationalism. So that's the primordialist position. Sometimes it gets called the traditionalist position. And that's basically what Azar Gad is arguing in this book. Uh, the main point of this is to critique the modernist position, um, but he goes further than the ethno symbolists as well. And he says that nations as well as ethnicities pre-existing modernity now what i find with these debates is uh, a lot of times the disagreements uh, come down to kind of terminological differences um so what he means by uh, nation and nationalism is going to be important in, in that context but unlike other sociologists and this is important he actually focuses on biology uh, and he focuses on genetic relatedness uh, and sociobiology, uh, kinship, the things we know about that as it relates to uh, sort of um, Darwinian explanations. He focuses on that uh, as a factor in explaining nationalism, which I think is, is hugely important. I mean, I think the first place you look when you want to talk about nationalism is you look at, you know, that we are, um, we are biological creatures and that we, uh, you know, we observe this phenomenon all throughout nature, you know, kinship, kin selection, um, groups, favoritism within groups. And, you know, the fact that that's left out of sociological discussions of nationalism seems to me to be uh, just, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, how can you, how can you separate those two things? Uh, so he says nationalism is the elephant in the room whose huge presence has been consistently overlooked, unaccounted for, and downplayed in the major social uh, theories of the modern period. So as I said, terminological issues abound in these discussions. So it is a, a kind of important to get his definitions out there because they're different from uh, Walker Connors, who we covered earlier. So if you watch that video back, Walker Connor basically said that the debate around nationalism is all wrong in academia because they keep confusing nationalism for just loyalty to the state, for patriotism. And if you do that, you can really deconstruct nationalism. You can deconstruct it in all kinds of ways. Obviously, the state is a modern creation. The states that exist now, and you know, you can do all kinds of uh, sort of linguistic tricks with that. So Walker Connor says nationalism is just loyalty to the extended ethnic group. It's when an ethnic group becomes kind of conscious of itself in the world and sort of politicizes itself. Now that's not quite what uh, Azar Gat goes for. He says. First of all, ethnicity is a population of shared kinship and culture. That itself is kind of different from Walker Connor because Walker Connor would have just said that it was a, a group, like an observable anthropological group 
uh, like shared descent. He focuses on shared kinship rather than shared descent, which again, mightn't seem like a huge distinction, but it actually is important. He says, although a perception of common descent is often defined as a constitutive element of ethnicity, for example, by Max Weber and Walker Connor, the concept advanced here specifies kinship rather than descent. Common descent is only one, albeit prevalent subcategory within the broader category of shared kinship or blood relation. This is a subtle but important and generally overlooked distinction. That is the notion of the extended family, which is typical of an ethnos and ethnicity. And this notion often, but not always, includes common descent. In many cases, there is a strong sense based on tradition that the ethnos was originally made up of separate groups that came together and amalgamated into one. The Romans, for example, had strong traditions that they originated from Latin and Sabine groups, which joined together at the founding of Rome. Uh, we could also think of, I suppose, you know, the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans uh, with the, uh, the English ethnicity. The French have a tradition of sort of mixed origin, Gauls, Romans, Germans. Uh, so I think that's a fair point to make. Um, now, ethnicity is distinct from race due to the cultural elements, so it's shared kinship and culture. But it is important to note, I think, that this is a, a modern way of looking at things up to the 20th century. Um, we didn't really talk about ethnicity. Uh, people would say the Italian race, the Irish race, the German race, the French race. Um, but it was two trends. It was, you know, the bad taste left in people's mouth after World War II. Um, and also that in the 19th early 20th century, there had been a lot of, um, you know, discussion of uh, eugenics and racial science, this kind of thing. Um, and in that discussion, race came to be this kind of broader uh, um, you know, European or Nordic race or whatever they were categorized. So ethnicity became a term that came into more common usage um, to separate these smaller groups within races. Um, he also specifies a people, which is something that modernists won't discuss as much or will ignore really. Common and distinctive historical entity between a nation and ethnos, an, eth an ethnos with a sense of common identity, history, and fate. Um, I think, I mean, that would be pretty much Walker Connor's definition of uh, uh, a nation, would be a, an, eth an ethnic group that has a a sense of itself that sort of separates itself. Uh, of course, Walker Connor thinks that nations didn't really exist until the 19th century. Um, so Gad obviously disagrees with that. And then a nation is a people uh, that is politically sovereign, um, either as a dominant majority or the politically central element in a multi-ethnic state or empire. So this is where I guess Gatz kind of separates himself from most of academia on this question that he says, okay, nationalism, you know, the modernists will say nationalism as this sort of mass political phenomenon didn't exist until the 18th century. Um, Gatz says fine, but this is kind of, you can't push that too far and say that nations didn't exist because a nation, you know, this is a phenomenon of political ethnicity, and it came on a mass scale in the 18th, 19th century after industrialization, mass communications, inventions, and so on. But ethnicity has always been central to politics. And you have had nations which, you know, wouldn't have called themselves nationalists or wouldn't have this sort of conception of like the, you know, the ethnos together is ruling the state. But still, you have states where they're very conscious that their ethnic group is the dominant majority um, and that you know the state and the ethnic group are inseparable and the state kind of is for the glory of that ethnic group and Gat says well it's fair to call this uh, it's fair to call these nations um, you know unless you're being very restrictive with your with your definitions and it has to be this sort of um, ideological universal conception of things um, then he says you can push nations right back to the first states. Nationalism is the ideology that a people is bound together in solidarity, faith, and common political aspirations. So again, 
Walker Connor's idea of nationalism uh, is just the, the loyalty to that individual ethnic group. Um, and as our Gats is something kind of similar. It's not this universal enlightenment doctrine. Um, it's not this sort of universal conception of things that every ethnic group has a right to rule itself. He's using it more in the particular sense that um, a people feels for itself that they're bound together, that they have a common political faith, they have a common past, shared present, shared future. And so he's using it much more the way that I think people sort of intuitively use that word, um, the way that we colloquially use that word, not as a, um, a sort of a, a fleshed out ideology, but just as that sort of uh, instinctive loyalty to the group. Now, this is sort of where we get to his contentions with the modernists, which is that ethnicity has always been political. So nationalism, uh, as him and Walker Connor define it, is you know when ethnicity becomes politicized, when an ethnicity gets a conception of itself, they differentiate themselves from other groups. Um, but what Gatt says is that, well, ethnicities have always you know, they've always known that they were ethnicities uh, and there's always been a political element to this. So nationalism is one form of the broader phenomenon of political ethnicity. And this is really what this book studies is the history of political ethnicity, which often translates into nationalism and nations, national states. So ethnicity has always been political, according to Gad. And what theorists label territorial states or dynastic monar monarchies tend to be national monarchies, they especially do this with the Middle Ages. And, you know, we saw Adrian Hastings argued against that. And really the, you know, the vast majority of medieval historians would, would support this contention that these were national monarchies largely. And even in larger structures like multi-ethnic empires, ethnicity was still political. States were often informally dominated by one ethnic group. Uh, so again, this is, separate like uh, if you have like a sort of puritan puritanical sort of definition of nationalism that it has to be nationalism only exists if there's like a universal ideology and a the group is like explicitly the majority group and the state is for that people well he says no you can you have to look at the phenomenon of political ethnicity in history as a translated to empires were often you could have a multi-ethnic empire and maybe the the dominant ethnic group would only be 60 70 percent of the population but if they're very consciously in charge and holding the positions of power and um you know the sort of mythos uh, and symbols and history of their ethnic group is tied up with that of the empire well you have to look at the uh, you know you have to look at the political element of ethnicity here as well and very few nations if any have been divorced from ethnicity so we go right back to pre-modern uh, ethno-national identity and the perception of one's peoples and countries as holy was prevalent throughout history. Uh, this is, you know, something that supports uh, his idea that there's always been a sort of political self-conception of ethnicity. Rather than conflicting with the national idea, religion has always been one of its strongest pillars. Um, this was also discussed in the Hastings video, you know, all the sort of mythology around like Joan of Arc and the way uh, religious symbolism is often tied up with uh, national symbolism. I, think, I guess Serbia is probably a really good example. Large scale imagined communities existed prior to print technology, national religions, pre existed universalist religions. So, this is a, again a kind of contention with the modernists who talk about so called imagined communities and that these are made possible with uh, mass communications devices, the printing press, mass society. Uh, that's what gives you mass culture. That's what gives you nationalism. Well, Gatt makes some good arguments in the book that actually modernists overlooked the, the many ways that imagined communities could uh, reach a kind of mass scale in pre-modernity. And religion is a good example that shows that that was the case. People could have these massive shared religions without a printing press, um, you know, without the telegraph or the telephone, because they spread myths through, you know, literate people that did travel and um, pass on uh, these things to the illiterate masses. Obviously, you have things like plays, 
uh, dramas, songs, uh, oral traditions. So th there's a myriad of ways that ancient people obviously had of transmitting culture. And what generally happens with the modernists is they just kind of ignore this. And it's, it's also a point he makes that national religions pre-existed universalist religions. So we know that pre-modern uh, ethnic groups had culture had self-conceptions because they had nationalist religions, uh, national religions that came before universalist religions. Um, and the pre-modern masses, while they were illiterate, uh, they still had myths and stories transmitted by the literati, as I said. Uh, another point, obviously, that's problematic for the modernists is ethnicity and foreign conquest. Gatz says the most tangible test for the existence of pre-modern national affinities is the following. Did pre-modern peoples view foreign intrusion and rule with total indifference and apathy, as modernists claim, because their horizons were wholly parochial and they regarded the elite that exploited them as alien and foreign as the conquerors? So this is a claim that modernists have to make, that basically the, the, the masses throughout history didn't really care who was in charge. You know, if any kind of proto-nationalism existed, it existed just among the elite, the literate, the cultured, uh, the masses, you know, empires change, rulers change, religions change, and the masses are just kind of passive throughout history, right? This is the sort of modernist view of things until you get mass culture. But obviously, you look at how fiercely um, people throughout history resisted foreign conquest, and this kind of throws a spanner in the works. And if you try and find some well, this was like a elite manipulation. It doesn't really stand up to historical examples. Its submission to foreign rule was often achieved only after desperate popular resistance. I have the picture of um, the defense of, uh, of Thermopylae. I mean, that's obviously the, a good historical example, but I'm sure anyone watching this can think of endless historical examples, even just from their own country's history. Foreign rulers often made attempts to cultivate a native image. You know, we, this is also something we're familiar with through history. Rulers sort of uh, adopting customs and religion of somewhere they conquer. Now, if the masses were just this purely passive thing that didn't care about national identity, um, that didn't care if the rulers were foreign, why would the rulers even go to those lengths? Uh, because people in pre-modern states lacked individual freedom, the purpose of their struggle can only be collective freedom national independence you know the uh the spartans fighting off the persians obviously they're not concerned about uh, the persians are going to take away our individual freedom or uh you know property rights or uh, economic success or anything like this it's obvious that this is a, a collective struggle this is groups uh conflicting against each other so clearly this is politically uh, focus on ethnicity. Clearly, it's about group conquest. Support for uprisings against foreign rule usually came from the masses, with the wealthy elite section of society more inclined to cooperate. Um, again, it's just another thing that's uh, played out through history. Um, we used the example last time in the, the Hastings video of Ethiopia, where it was like a, a mass uprising when uh, an emperor there tried to change the religion uh from christianity and the masses despite being in a, a pre-modern african state revolted so this was something that happened there were mass revolts and it was usually heavily charged by ethnicity by kind of primitive nationalism another thing modernists claim is that national identity was invented in the cities you get industrialization you get your peasant population moving to the cities, uh, division of labor, et cetera, et cetera. You have people conglomerated in these urban centers, you have newspapers and discussion, and then you get mass culture. You get the, finally the masses, the peasants have culture. Um, they get mass education. And so there's this fantasy of nationalism invented to, uh, to kind of unify them. Um, that's the, the modernist take. So modernists focus on the cities as the birthplace of nationalism, and this is very important for their narrative. Is It's something sort of inorganic. It's, again, manufactured. 
But the problem is that it was the countryside that was perceived as the true repository of national identity, and it was mainly from rural materials of language and custom, custom that it was forged. So there's a quote from the historian Tom Nairn here. He says, using the example of Czech nationalism, Czech nationalism was made in Prague, undoubtedly, but its ethnic characteristics came out of Bohemia, Moravia, and the Sudetenland, and were not and were not themselves made in the familiar sense of invented. Traditions are also a real matrix born forward from past times by individuals and families, not creation ex nihilo, and the past, which is mainly counted here, is that of peasant existence. Nationalism became so potent in modernity because the masses were better able to voice their preferences, which tended to be nationalistic. This is something I'll cover later on. But the key point is, it's not coming out of nothing in the cities. Yes, you know, urbanization, people sharing culture, education, does give you a sort of mass phenomenon of nationalism. But where is that coming from? The peasants are bringing that with them into the cities. And that's why it's powerful. That's why uh, elites can use it. That's why it can translate to education and to literacy. It's because the peasants were bringing this from a, a pre-industrial, pre-modern state with them. That's what they uh, related to. And then you can just look at the ethnic nationalisms that sprung up. They tended to be in predominantly agrarian societies. Ireland, Serbia, Greece, Russia, uh, Ruthenia, um, Czechia. You can look at any any example of, of the emergent ethnic nationalisms that tended to be agrarian uh, societies because these were these were traditions and these were ethnic self-conceptions that had existed for a very very long time outside of industrial centers outside of mass culture we're already sort of seeing like the the biases of of modernity of modernists um if you can call them you know biases or blind spots things they overlook and gat touches on this um walker connor also uh, touched on this very well and really deconstructed um the modernist approach and the academic approach generally to nationalism and why it gets it so wrong so as mentioned modernists propose that due to their novelty nations and nationalism purely historical and arbitrary and a big problem Gat notes is that marxism and liberalism are currently the dominant social theories but they lack conceptual frameworks to comprehend the deep roots of ethnicity and nationalism um you know as mentioned i mean as as we all recognize like the the liberal sort of marxist approach obviously is especially the marxist approach is to say that everything is a social construct everything is false consciousness everything is the capitalist elite sort of developing um these artificial barriers for their own benefit and of course if not for the capitalist class system we'd have global uh you know, we have a, a global revolution of the proletariat and communism, and we'd have a, a classless and now with modern communist way to see a borderless society. And so they think that any any divisions, ethnic divisions, ethnic conflict, it has to be, it just has to be an elite capitalist manufactured plot, right? Uh, it's the, the liberal conception of things as well, right? Everyone would hold hands and sing Kumbaya, if not for these uh, ignorances that keep us divided. With the Marxists, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, class barriers um but you know that's being sort of transmuted and hidden by these fake divisions you know the working class is divided by imagined um ethnic differences inventions of race and the, the liberal conception of things of course is that we're progressing towards a kind of um transhuman future we're progressing towards this mass global market where everyone is an interchangeable uh, sort of cog if moving towards this sort of gray mass everything is fungible um everything can be transmitted capital can be moved from one continent to another at the, the click of a button and people labor can be moved from continent to continent we're all interchangeable so this is obviously the, the dominant view in academia academics for the most part are massively committed to a kind of radical egalitarianism and so they don't want to touch things like uh, ethnicity and nationalism, especially if there's potentially a biological component to it. Modernists tend to confuse imagined and invented communities. This was also something Walker Connor covered well. If you want to go back and watch 
um, my video on that, that academics, because they're academics, because they're trying to find sort of objective metrics, objective ways of studying things, they want to put everything in a box. If, if something is, is kind of subjective as a phenomenon, right? Nationalism has a large subjective component, right? There's something that is kind of feel, you know, there's there's a certain feeling I get of, uh, you know, of, of Irishness, of Irish nationalism that couldn't really be uh, translated sort of objectively. Um, but modernists see that as, as kind of a deconstruction. They say, well, if something is, is, is imagined in this way, it has to be invented. It has to be some kind of... Uh, false consciousness where it's really um just because communities are you know they have this subjective imagined component doesn't mean that it was uh, kind of manufactured these things can kind of spring up organically they largely ignore insights of biology and sociobiology as an overreaction against social darwinism so this kind of ties into what i was saying previously you know the commitment to egalitarianism obviously ideas of uh social Darwinism and race science are abhorrent to the modern academy. And so they overcorrect. And if anyone wants to mention sociobiology uh, and say, hey, maybe there's a, maybe there's this biological component to human behavior that means that we're always going to fall into groups. Or, you know, maybe that explains this conflict. Uh, they don't want to hear about that. He also says, quote, furthermore, it is probably not a coincidence that the pioneering modernist theorists, Cohn, Deutsch, Gellner, Hobsbawm, were all Jewish immigrant refugees from Central Europe and Eli Kaduri uh, from the Middle East during the first half of the 20th century. All of them experienced changing identities and excruciating, excruciating questions of self-identity at the time of the most extreme violent and unsettling nationalistic eruptions. So uh, a quick look at sociobiology and ethnicity. Gat, it's, as I said, is one of the few people that focuses on the relevance of sociobiology to understanding ethnicity. And, you know, very simply, I mean, the, the most basic sort of insight of sociobiology, you know, people tend to prefer close kin who share more genes with them to more remote kin or strangers. Um, you know, E.O. Wilson and people in sociobiology, a lot of them had this idea of group evolution, group evolutionary strategy, that evolution happens on the level of the group, not just, uh, it's not genes primarily that are driving evolution, but it's, it's group strategy and group competition. And so because groups are in competition, they develop sort of collective strategies for survival. Um, and this obviously translates up to primates, it translates up to humans. And so in that sense, uh, forms of ethnic group cooperation uh, can be explained by sociobiology. So sociobiology has been gaining ground rapidly since the 1970s, all the while sociologists have basically ignored it and continue with these purely, um, everything is a social construct explanation of things. Um, and it's just, you know, it's taken for granted. There's no one challenging this in sociology. They don't have to really defend this against the insights of biology because, uh, you know, they can use all kinds of um, sort of academic uh, pill pull to deconstruct biological arguments. Uh, he says it meant uh, on the academic ignoring of this, he says it meant turn a blind eye to a whole side of reality for it is both nature and nurture, indeed precisely the interaction between them that has always shaped people and human societies. Genes are not everything, of course, but they're hardly irrelevant or disconnected from culture. Preference for one's kin, uh, culture group, this is a term he uses, kin culture group, um, which, you know, you can argue about nations, but kin culture groups, he argues, are something that has always been around in human societies. It's a very strong selection force in the Aboriginal human way of life because competition and conflict between individuals and groups was very intense. You know, we know that Rousseau's myth of the noble savage is, is wrong, basically. There was intense conflict in primitive human societies. Of course, the more ethnocentric groups outlasted the less cohesive ones. So our evolutionary inheritance. Scientific studies reveal that most ethnic groups are closely related. People are often more genetically similar to ethnic groups they view as hostile, but this doesn't mean that kinship is irrelevant to ethnicity. 
so uh, again, he's just kind of in before in some of the typical deconstructions that, well, there could be an ethnic group that's in conflict, but maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the English and Irish are in conflict. Maybe there's someone in the, the Irish group who's more related to uh, the English people that he, he sees as the enemy than the Irish people that he sees as an ally. But this actually isn't really a challenge um, to Gat's overall argument because there's still the, the myth of common descent that's there with the group. Um, and you say, okay, well, that's that's like a, that's a mistake in this individual person, that's kind of false consciousness. But the fact that that myth is there uh, precisely, uh, that is there precisely because people throughout history have been so prone to generate it as the supreme bond. Um, so even if you can find like edge cases uh, and argue that that deconstructs the whole thing, well, the fact that that myth is so powerful in the first place shows uh, that you know, it has evolved and survived throughout time. So cultural takeoff since the advent of agriculture and the state is too recent to significantly affect human biology. You know, this is a, another thing people may argue as well. Okay, we had this sort of primitive group competition. Um, the insights of sociobiology applied up to a point. But, you know, we're not those people anymore. We have culture, we're civilized, we have individualism. Um, and we've, we've kind of evolved out of that. But biologically, we're virtually the same people as our Stone Age forefathers. So while culture um, does shape us, and while, you know, of course, we can have sort of individualist political systems and so on, still biologically, these, um, you know, these tendencies, these ethnocentric, ethnocentric tendencies exist on a much deeper level. And Marxists and liberals are continually at a loss to explain the powerful force of biological kinship in history. Example he uses, Marxists were shocked by the eruption of cross-class nationalist sentiment in World War I. Um, they, many Marxists did not think that they would ever see the kind of national conflict of World War I. They thought people were moving towards a universal conception of things, you know, things were industrializing, the working class was getting a conception of itself, and they didn't think that people would be willing to shed blood for these old monarchies. But uh, the national bond has been strong throughout history. So now we get to the focus of his book, which is a history of the na of nations. Um, and he goes right back to tribes. Obviously, you have these kin culture groups that exist as tribes that have a strong degree of, of uh, ethnic, of uh, biological relatedness and biological favoritism, very insular. The rise of agriculture means the stratification of inequalities and move away from traditional kin based clan structure to the formation of the first states. Sometimes this is a very violent process. Um, identities are lost tribal identities clan identities and you get these these bigger uh, identifications um but although there's this process of of loss of identity ethnicity is still important constituent development of the first states there's a new aristocracy um instead of old tribal affiliations instead of the you know the, the big man or the chief that's in charge of everything now you have this uh you have this solidified uh, sort of class system, private property. Um, you know, you have a sort of aristocratic class uh, that you know has more resources than everyone else. You've sort of a warrior caste, um, and yeah, you get this kind of stratification of society. But the state's for, uh, foundation and kinship bonds makes this process a lot easier if you're trying to create the stratified. Uh, caste society and it's just all of these strangers obviously that's uh, that's not going to be very feasible so what's shaping all of this of course is uh, the ethnic uh, kinship that's there now he looks at the city states and obviously we would think of city states as you know very sort of uh, enlightened places we think of like the, the greek city states um we don't really think of of tribalism or certainly not nationalism but gad argues that patriotism associated with the city state derived directly from its people's sense of common kin culture identity. 
He says, the little known as fact is that city-states, while of course not wholly homogeneous, were ethnically constituted. As in all other polity types, ethnicity was terribly political and highly significant. City-states tended to conflict with one another despite being closely related, but when a more foreign enemy presented a challenge, they would often coalesce into larger alliances. Um, so the tendency you get with city-states, individual city-states have very close ethnic relatedness, um, lots of kinship there, and city-states tended to come in sort of clusters like Sumer or Greece. Greece is the obvious example, but then there's a larger uh group relatedness in the cluster so you know there's the greek city states and each of those have their own kind of kinship bonds but then you know it's there's kind of this larger circle of of the greek uh, bond as well um and you can see throughout history that when when they as much conflict as they have um you know like spartans and athenians when there's this larger thread that then the, the larger sort of group bond uh, comes to the fore there. So you see, you know, this Ken culture identity uh, and how it shapes the political conception of things. So although the Athenian polis eroded the old tribes in significance, it remained based on the ethnically related population of Attica, which shared Ken culture attributes. Although Athens attracted many immigrants, most were ethnically Greek and they assimilated into local culture and also only autochthonous Athenians who were descended from two Athenian parents qualified for citizenship. So it certainly wasn't this, uh, this sort of open multicultural modern city. Um, and there is someone that wrote a book that I think was just called the Athenian nation that actually argued, um, he's an academic that actually argued that, uh, Athens, the city-state of Athens could be considered a, a nation and that there was a nationalism there. Um, I don't think Gak goes that far, but he certainly says that, you know, ethnicity was important to these people. You can also look at Sumer, which was the, the first city-state. Um, and, you know, what happened is a few dozen Sumerian city-states emerged in the late fourth millennium BC. Uh, Sumer and, and Egypt are the earliest known civilizations. Uh, they shared a language, although each city-state had its own patron god. They also shared a pantheon, ritual texts, a script, and culture in general. Quote, in short, the Sumerians were an ethnos. Again, similar to the Greeks, um, that they have they have their individual gods and so on, but there's also this uh, these larger cultural forms that unite them as a Greek people. What happens in Sumer is Sumerian city-states were conquered by foreign Semitic peoples led by Sargon of Akkad. And this is a quote from a historian of Sumer on the reasons for fierce resistance uh, to the Akkadians that's included in this book. One is that the Sumerians considered Sargon and his sons of Akkad to be foreigners, another that the cities had lost their relative autonomy. After Sargon's death, the Sumerian city-states revolted in a victory or death rebellion against the successor. Revolt seems to have been a popular mass affair. Um, the elites seem to have colluded more with the occupiers, um, and this is something that's common through history. So we see here in the, the very earliest states, there's a, a mass revolt. Um, there's no printing press, there's no, there's no telegraph. Uh, but people are in mass revolt uh, against an enemy because they're uh, against an occupier because they're foreign. So very interesting from uh, this perspective, ethnicity in ancient Greece. Uh, the ancient Greeks are a quintessential case study for the political role of ethnicity. In historical times, they had a strong sense of being a single ethnos, which shared blood ties, language, a pantheon, mythology, traditional texts, for example, Homer and Hesiod, cultic centers like Delphi, and not least the Olympic Games. All the others, non-Greeks, were barbarians. Greek was divided into four major dialects, Ionic, Doric, Aeolic, and Arcadian, and each dialect group tended to possess its own sense of kinship. And uh, it does seem, you know, there are obviously conflicts between these, these different groups in Greece. For example, Sparta functioned as an oppressive military regime with a Spartan minority ruling over a Helot majority. As we know, this is common history, but 
what's interesting is that it's believed now that this may have resulted from the subjugation of a native Achaean population that was there by invading Dorians. And the, the, uh, that this was actually kind of an ethnic split, that the, the Helot majority, um, these sort of second class citizens were the natives that had been conquered and subjugated. Um, uh, what kind of backs this up is non-Spartan Dorians, uh, other ethnic Dorians that weren't Spartan, uh, when they were in Sparta's territory, they weren't enslaved and they enjoyed special economic freedoms that no one else did. So this highlights an ethnic division that's at the, the root of, of Spartan exploitation and conflict. Uh, it's very interesting because it goes outside of the state. Now, the threat of Persia, of course, encourages pan-Greek co co cooperation. And, you know, you can imagine modernists pointing to, well, look at the, there are instances, of course, look at city-states that colluded with the Persians, look at where conflict between the Greeks sort of got in the way of fighting the Persians. It did happen, but at the same time, it was certainly not the, the norm. There were instances of it. And there was, there was specifically a charge of medism to people that collaborated with the Persians. If you were seen to be sympathetic to the Persians, if you were accused of collaborating with them, you could be charged with medicine, which was a sign of great shame to be this, you know, you're a traitor, you're a, you know, you're a traitor to your people that you, you're choosing the Persians over your people. So this, you know, that itself existence shows this kind of larger ethnic self-conception. There's a quote from Herodotus. Um, he talks about the, the, response of of the athenians to the spartans when they're seeing if they would have their support against persia and herodotus the historian the greek historian said that uh in this letter that was written to his to the spartans was written the kinship of all greeks in blood and speech and the shrines of gods and the sacrifices that we have in common and the likeness of our way of life to all which it would ill beseem athenians to be false so you see here the Athenians writing to the Spartans saying, look, we have our division, certainly, but we've, we're kinship, we have kinship in blood, in blood and speech. So it, they're, they're drawing on a larger Greek ethnicity and saying we're related by blood. There's a, a kinship there and speech. There's also a cultural element and the shrines of gods and sacrifice we have in common. There's also a religious element. So all of these things are, are bound up in, in, uh, in ancient states um but the city states the greek city states the sumerian city states they're certainly not national states um there's a larger larger ethnic self-conception but they're not national states but gad argues that there are such things as national states and actually in the majority of cases dynastic kingdoms were actually national monarchies where ethnos and state converged and egypt which emerged around 3000 bc as a unified state uh, it emerged around the people with a shared ethnicity quote there was never any doubt that the empire was merely the periphery of the state and the people of egypt with their distinctive culture or civilization nor was there any doubt about egypt's identity when the country was periodically taken over by foreign invaders egyptians maintained a sense of unity even in times when central rule disintegrated so you know there's this uh, as part of the modern thesis there's what's called uh, instrumentalism that says that national identity is only a creation of the state but you look at egypt and you know there were long periods where egypt was separated parts were under foreign rule um or there was different rulers for different parts but it's it's evident throughout that time people never lost a sense of this larger egyptian nation um so there isn't this instrumental top-down uh changing of the identity there and egyptian text and air keenly represents any differences between egyptians and foreigners uh you can see that the image i've included there you can find plenty of these online the way they sort of uh you know they seem very fascinated with like differences between groups and they emphasize them in art obviously they have a conception that there's something that is to be an egyptian there's something that looks like there's other groups that look and, and feel and sound different um but the common skeptical response is to say that the masses didn't feel any sense of shared culture with elites and, you know i can imagine people that subscribe to the modernist thesis just laughing at this right ancient egypt and nationalism i mean the idea of of 
putting those together is just it's so laughable. It's just uh, these sort of silly online nationalists that don't understand the uh, the sociology of this and uh, don't understand that nationalism is this uh, this enlightenment liberal conception of things. But to say that the the masses didn't feel a, a sense of shared culture with the elites. Again, it's uh, there's a lot of sort of begging the question here because, as he says, all the evidence shows that the Egyptian masses were no less absorbed in cult and ritual than and cherished their traditions than the Egyptian state. Um, sorry, the Egyptian state, religion, and civilization were all national. Um, so again, modernists often beg the question and and just assume that the masses didn't have any shared sense of of, of kinship or culture and that. If you find nationalism in a text like Shakespeare or something that, well, this had to be just confined to the elites, but rarely is that, is that really backed up. And again, they overlook a lot of ways that the masses could transmit culture through, through myth and, and oral traditions and so on. Egyptians understood foreigners as such and resented them for it. Egyptian rulers often appealed to national sentiment in times of outside threat. Now, at a time when, uh, part of egypt was occupied by the semitic hyksos people and then in the south they were occupied by another uh, group from sub-saharan africa it seems there's a quote from prince thebas who is trying to raise the people in revolt uh, against this foreign occupation and uh, he says quote one prince rules in avaris another in ethiopia and here i am associated with an asiatic and a n-word i mean probably uh, don't want to get the channel demonetized. Uh, each has his slice of Egypt. None can rest in peace. The spoil us all are by the imposts of the Asiatics. I will grapple with them. I will save Egypt and overthrow the Asiatics. So, you know, is that an appeal to uh, Egyptian nationalism? Um, you know, it certainly looks like it. And he did raise a popular revolt so you know again if this is uh if this is just an elite sort of manufactured thing and he's maybe he's manufacturing it here when he makes this appeal why why even choose that to appeal to clearly it resonates with the masses or these princes wouldn't appeal to it in order to get support of the masses right uh, he also looks at the ancient near east um i mean the jews are an obvious example and even modernist academics a lot of them acknowledge that well okay the jews kind of throw a spanner in the works here because yeah they kind of are a nation going right back and they do have a sense of nationalism um and almost no matter what way you define nationalism it seems to apply to the jews because even if you say that well just ethnic self-identification or tribalism that's that's a separate thing from nationalism nationalism is bound up with a certain conception of the state it's a, a people wedded to a state and a place that's like the most restrictive view of nationalism you could have that it, it has to be about a patch of land and the people and the state well that applies to jews because even in the uh you know in, in the torah it says what the what the boundaries of israel should be you know that it ends at this river um up to this point up to this mountain so it says that the, the jews are a people and they have a land um, and they even specify like the the geography and the border of that land uh and obviously they, they had states so this is i mean like i said even the modernists as far as i can tell most of them seem to acknowledge that like the jews are kind of a challenge to the modernist thesis um and also jewish society is highly literate um so you know, it's not like other societies where you say, well, maybe the top 5% had a, a self-conception of their national identity, but this was never a mass phenomenon. Well, with the Jews, again, they're highly literate, um, so they can read the Torah. Um, so, you know, that criticism runs into problem again with the Jews. The Hebrew Bible divides people into, divides humanity into peoples, goy, and it views them in kin terms as families of the earth. Uh, this isn't like cultural or language groups, but it talks about peoples as as blood relatives, as family. And of course, it talks about the Jews as as a chosen people. There's obviously a, a, a Jewish nationalism there. There's a, you know, the Jews want to be separate, they're their own God, they feel that they're chosen. Um, so yeah, and then to crush indigenous revolts, uh, there are cases where Assyria and then Babylon uh, carried out massive deportations throughout their realm. Uh, they deported ethnic groups that they saw as being troublesome because they wouldn't accept foreign rule. 
Um, and he gives examples of national states in the Near East, Babylonia and Assyria themselves, uh, Elam, Media Persia, and Lydia. Then he looks to ancient China, and China is interesting uh, because you know if you can shoot if you can show that any of this stuff applies to China, it's a real problem for the modernists because again, China Chinese civilization is 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 older than European civilization. The Chinese state is, is older than states in Europe. Um, and, you know, the modernists heavily focus on Europe, but to see this as a, as a kind of universal phenomenon in, in the older states is, is much more of a problem to them. So there's a couple of quotes by historians here that uh, talk about the history of China. And one is, earlier attempts to explain China's remarkable record of unity focused inevitably perhaps on the super elite of scholar bureaucrats. One must consider the role of ordinary people, farmers, artisans, shopkeepers, midwives, silk reelers, and laborers who were engaged in the construction of a unified culture. In this view, peasants are not, as some have claimed, easy material for ideological molding. They are leading actors in performing what we have come to call Chinese culture. So this is a historian that's criticizing this top-down sociological view where the masses just don't really do anything they're just uh going with the current of history and they don't really have a culture or self-conception he says this doesn't apply at all to china um another one james townsend from uh, a paper on chinese nationalism for the majority of the population culturalism would have been less important than their primary ethnic identification it seems likely that most chinese thought of their cultural and political community their nation as a chinese one and that culturalism, to the extent that they understood it, reinforced their sense that the empire was properly Chinese. Um, now, there's a few things about ancient China that shows that there's a, a national, it's a national state. There's a national self-conception of things. Um, there's a literary culture, um, unlike, unlike any sort of pre-modern European state, there's a literary culture, there's mass education, and there's universal military service. And all of these, interestingly enough, are regarded by modernists as what's necessary for the creation of national identity. That this is why nationalism emerges, as you have mass literacy, mass education, and universal military service. All of these things need a kind of national mythos to unite people, but they're all present in ancient China. Um, the national service led to the fraternization between men from other provinces. Um, so if there was sort of small local um parochial identifications uh as you know again walker connor who i covered in the first video says uh, prior to the 19th century nationalism didn't really exist and uh he says he uses the example of france people identify with like Brittany or whatever area they were in um and he says these parochial identifications were primary well in china you have national service lead into the interaction of, of people from uh, all areas of china and they also get educated and indoctrinated into service to the emperor and the country there's a there's a, a national idea that's that spread to these people like you know you're not serving your uh, your village you're not serving your uh, your smaller sort of uh, clan you're serving china the idea is is there right back in ancient china Confucianism posited the emperor as the supreme head of the family to whom the people owed not only obedience, but also devotion and love, an image common in national states. As early as the first millennium BC, Chinese writers regularly contrasted superior Chineseness with foreign barbarism. Some of these writers treated the foreigners as a biological, barely human race. Um, and uh, he quotes from uh, some of that in the book, actually, um, where you have these you have these uh, Chinese philosophers and writers that are uh, talking about like the you know the blood relation of, of the Chinese and how important that is and, and contrasting that to um, like differences that they observe in non Chinese. Um, is there any, uh, sorry the Taiping Rebellion is another example of course um, this is a pretty wild rebellion in the nineteenth century. Um, where you have this basically theocratic uh, Christian communist state that revolts against the um, ruling 
Qing dynasty. But there's a strong ethnic component to this because the rebels, um, uh, the rebels are primarily this uh, Han ethnic group um, and a couple of other uh, ethnic groups uh, and the revolting against the ruling Manchu Qing dynasty. And this was despite centuries of Manchu imperial propaganda. Um, it wasn't capable of preventing the resurfacing of powerful popular sentiments against foreign rule in a mass popular rebellion. So the Taiping Rebellion is interesting because although obviously there's a strong religious component, uh, there's a strong ethnic element there. Um, and for a long time, there had been a, a tradition of sort of anti-Manchu sentiment that the, the Manchu were ruling the Han. And there was a sense that the, the Manchu were barbarians, that they were less cultured, and that they were forcing their ways, their ethnic traditions on the Han. The Han resented that. And again, against the instrumentalist view of the state, sort of manufacturing all this stuff, the Manchu did everything to, to try and manufacture a, 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 an identity that left out this, uh, this resentment. But again, this sort of proto-nationalism kept re-emerging. And a really interesting example of this, um, Gad only mentions this, this guy in passing, but I found this really interesting quote by this Chinese philosopher, uh, Wang Fuji, who's a, a Confucian philosopher. And he was very anti-Manchu, and he organized and took part in rebellions uh, against the Manchu who were ruling China. Um, but he actually, you know, he was a philosopher. He wrote, you know, he had sort of cosmological theories and so on. But what's interesting is he, uh, as they describe it, that he came up with like a, a complete theory of sort of anti-Manchuism. So it says Wang Fuji, this is from an encyclopedia of history, culture, and nationalism on modern China. Wang Fuji was especially remarkable for the sustained vigor of his struggle against the Manchus and for his systematic attempt to express his anti-Manchuism in a broad historical and philosophical context. Wang mobilized a force to resist Qing troops in 1648. After being defeated, he joined remnant Ming forces and fought on until 1650. For the remainder of his life, he pursued his studies and refused to have any dealings with the Manchus. Um, his research led him to the conclusion that the fundamental principles of heaven, earth, and man required an absolute distinction between societies. Although he acknowledged that similarities existed among human beings, for example, in the bone structure and sense organs of Chinese and Manchus, he nevertheless insisted that Chinese must be distinguished absolutely from the barbarians. Worthy rulers and great states had a solemn duty to protect their own kind and their own groups, especially against foreign invasion and conquest. And this was best assured by ethnic separatism. So I found this really fascinating. This guy is in 17th century China. Uh, you know, it's it's not any of the things modernists would say creates nationalism. There isn't, um, you know, there isn't the, the industrialization and the growth of liberalism trying to overthrow old religious orders. It's clearly not top down because this guy is in revolt against the state. He's just writing himself. And he basically formulates like a, a universal theory of ethno-nationalism here. He says that the worthy rulers, what justifies a ruler um, is that they protect their own group, their own kind, as he describes it. Um, and that's the that's sort of the, the popular sovereignty justification for that ruler's rule. Um, and he says that this is best assured by ethnic separatism. So he's basically formulating a, a theory of like universal ethno-nationalism, the proper way to govern the world is to have separate uh, separate nations for separate ethnic groups with popular rulers ruling on behalf of their group. So that is really, uh, you know, I mean, that's that really, uh, I'd like to see a modernist explain that, um, but it shows how kind of how kind of universal this is. And again, all of the typical deconstructions just kind of fall apart here because he's in revolt against, he's in revolt against the state. There's no like, uh, top-down manufacturing of national identity here and what's also interesting about this is um the emperor at the time actually uh gat touches on this a bit, a bit in the book that he actually wrote a response to the objections that wang wrote wang wrote like um these sort of anti like an anti-manchu thesis and the emperor actually responded to it and not only did he respond to it but he he decreed that this should be like read out uh, across villages that it should be taught to people. And the reason he did that is he, he wanted, 
of course, this this uh, he wanted to lessen these ethnic tensions to ensure the you know the smooth ruling uh, of of the Manchu of the Qing Dynasty. Um, but isn't it interesting that he wanted this to be transmitted to the masses? He wanted this to be read out in villages. Um, so again, you see a case where a ruler is trying to quell. Um, the potential for a mass uprising on the basis of ethnicity among the masses, um, which, you know, again, really supports uh, Gatt's idea that ethnicity has always been political, even in, in multi-ethnic states. Japan is another example he looks at because it was no less influenced by Chinese civilization than Korea, but even more protected by sea from China and the continent and filled with a sense of separateness and uniqueness. He says, Japan should have been paradigmatic in the study of pre-modern nationalism, and yet it barely figures in it. So, I mean, again, this is just something I encounter again and again. The modernists just very selectively look at history. This is something that Hastings noted, that modernists will look at history and they just skip right over the medieval period. And you just kind of just go straight from like pre-modern modern don't seriously look at the medieval period and then they have a bad analysis of nationalism well the same thing with the analysis of china and japan japan gets overlooked even though it's this very very old nation it's always had a sense of uniqueness separateness and like he says it's kind of a perfect study of, of nationalism japan has always been homogeneous since the emergence of the first unified japanese state and the the shoguns that ruled japan at various times you know they were supposedly chosen by the emperor but really they're just kind of uh, you know they're kind of dictators but they relied on this sense of japanese unity to justify their rule in the first place and the whole sacredness of the emperor as a deity and the symbol of the nation i mean this is heavily um you know his whole sort of aura is bound up with the sense of, of japanese-ness japanese unity and then of course there's a western presence in japan but after 1540, um, you know, you get this, uh, you get, you start getting conversion to Christianity. You could watch the movie uh, Silence by Martin Scorsese that covers this, which um, backs up a lot of the stuff we're discussing here. You know, the, the, the Japanese fiercely resist like these Jesuit missionaries and start, uh, you know, start torturing and killing converts to Christianity because they see this as a threat to their Japanese-ness. And this eventually led to the decision to banish all foreigners and close the country completely to outsiders. So, you know, back then, the 16th century, the Japanese have a feeling that, hey, our way of life, our uh, national identity is under threat from these outsider Europeans. Uh, medieval Europe, of course, we covered this in much greater detail in um, the video, The Emergence of Nations, looking at Adrian Hastings, who is a medieval historian. Um, so some similar themes in, in the Gap book that despite the modernist overlooking of medieval Europe, the large majority of historians who've addressed the subject tend to support the notion of medieval European nations. So this was bad news for the modernists that they, they had this nice sociological theory, but medieval historians have come along and the consensus is that the modernists are just wrong. They're just wrong on history. Medieval historians are in large agreement that nations existed medieval period nationalisms existed national states existed and uh yeah it's a, a big l for the modernists uh, they ignored early national state consolidation common across northern europe and instead they focused on cases such as the finns and the slovaks who lacked a history of political independence until the 20th century again like i said very selective choice of historical subjects a very selective biased reading of history this is what we find again and again with the modernist approach to nationalism uh the 12th century german priest helmold on tribes around the baltic this is a, an interesting quote that's included in the book in the 12th century his priest is, is writing about the geographical area of the baltic and he says many nations are seated about the sea the danes and the swedes whom we call northmen occupy the northern coast and all the islands it contains Along the southern shore dwell the Slavic nations, of whom, reckoning from the east, the Russians are the first, then the Poles, who on the north have the Prussians, on the south, the Bohemians, 
and those who are called Moravians and the Corinthians and the Sorbs. Now, again, as, as we said in the video on medieval nationalism, the emergence of nations, Hastings sees England as the first nationalism, the first national state. Um, and some similar arguments are made by Gad. Despite the modernist overlooking of medieval Europe, the large majority of the historians who have addressed the subject tend to support the notion of a medieval uh, of medieval European nations. English nation had emerged already by the 10th century. Uh, Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people took it for granted that the people of all the Anglo-Saxon petty states comprised one people. The peoples of England became unified politically against the threat of Viking invasion under Alfred the Great. And a common culture was facilitated by the proliferation of churches across England. A quote from the historian James Campbell, it may seem extravagant to describe early England as a nation state, nevertheless, it is unavoidable. I covered England in more detail in that uh, earlier video, if anyone wants to watch it, but yeah, similar arguments. Um, you know, again, you can look at the plays of Shakespeare, Hundred Years' War, all of these things that shape national identity, and there is a very old English nationalism there. Scandinavia, uh, which um, Hastings didn't cover so much, from about 1000 AD, earlier petty kingdoms crystallized into more or less permanent unified states in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And Nordic sagas were written in the 12th and 13th century, uh, which display the patriotic spirit of each nation. Modernists, of course, argue that the spirit is elite propaganda. Quote, however, the various Norwegian sagas and chronicles were actually composed in the most free, almost anarchic and unruly country of Europe, Iceland. So there was no elite patronage for this. This was, you know, something that was coming from amongst the folk. These chronicles take the differences between Nor Norwegians, Danes, Swedes, Russians and English for granted. Quote, the popular aspects of native national patriotism repeatedly manifest themselves in the text. And this is a quote from one of the texts, um, one of the texts, uh, Morkin Skinna, which is a, an Icelandic chronicle. Uh, quote, King Magnus established his rule as far as his father's power had extended, and he subdued the land without a battle and with the consent and agreement of all the people rich and poor. They all desired, they all desired rather to be free under King Magnus than to suffer the tyranny of the Danes any longer. Uh, the medieval German national empire, this is again interesting um, from our perspective, because I guess people would maybe point to Germany as a, a very modern nation, but of course he argues that the Holy Roman Empire was a German-based political order. The emperor's power rested primarily on the German lands and their German subjects. All but very few of the emperors were themselves German. Um, and so were all the ecclesiastical and lay princes of the electoral college, except for the king of Bohemia. So medieval um, Holy Roman Emperor, Empire was kind of interesting in that it had this way of sort of electing monarchs. Um, but yeah, everyone except the, the king of Bohemia, you know, I guess modern day Czech Republic, uh, they're all German. So again, very much a German dominated political order. Expansion eastward, which did happen, and of course they, they integrated other ethnic groups. But expansion eastward was explicitly for the benefit of, of Germans and involved cultural Germanization of the Slav populations. So, you know, we always hear this from both modernists and, and a lot of traditionalist type people as well, that, well, the, the model of, of medieval Europe was this universalist um, multi-ethnic empire. But again, you know, there's, uh, they're incorporating the Slav populations, but they're Germanizing them. And it's for the benefit of this core ethnic group. In 1512, the empire officially changed its name to the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. So, again, explicitly in the 16th century, um, it becomes, uh, you know, in writing, uh, this is a German nation, a German national empire. Um, you can also see this in various instances on, on the small level, uh, the way that this was common amongst the masses, for example, Martin Luther, title is tract written to Germany's nobles in 1520, addressed to the Christian nobility of the German nation. Late medieval maps of Germany depict a German nation united by language and culture, and with a strong sense of identity 
uh, German identity in popular poetry and also plays. And this is a quote again from another medieval historian, uh, Len uh, Leonard Krieger. The Holy Roman Empire under its Saxon, Salian, and Hohenstaufen uh, dynasties was regarded by its chroniclers as a German based political order. Authentic historians like Otto of Friesing and Alexander von Rose identified imperial history with German history. Um, now, while we're still on medieval history, there's some very interesting cases from church history as well uh, that shows the conception of things at this time. Um, I think Hastings covered this with Scotland, that Scotland in the 1300s wrote a letter to the Pope appealing for national independence where they, they explained how they were a different nation to the English and they had a very, it was very much a, a nationalist description of things. But it's interesting, there's some of these ecumenical councils in the 14th century and there's, the council has introduced uh, national voting blocks that corresponded to nations. Um, so from the 13th century on, there was a separate vote allotted to uh, the following nations at first, 1311, the Italians, Spaniards, Germans, Danes, English, Scots, Irish, and French. So these are nations that exist at the time, which supports the Hastings argument, supports the Azargad argument that you know, nations existed by this time, just not in their modern form. By 1409, um, they changed up the voting so that the, the great powers had more of a vote. And then there's this Council of Constance in 1416. Um, and there's this dispute that happens over separate representation. Uh, smaller nations are asking for representation on the basis of their separate language and sovereignty. And there's a dispute where France doesn't want England's inclusion. Obviously, there's a, a rivalry between France and England. France argues that England should be incorporated into this larger um, German vo voting bloc, that they're, they're not significant enough to get their own uh, vote. And the English delegation makes this argument that sounds like a very much a kind of modern, it sounds like the, the arguments that happen today around nationalism. They say, whether nation, natio, be understood as a people, gens, Marked off from others by blood relationship and habit of unity or by peculiarities of language, the most sure and positive sign and essence of a nation is divine and human law. Or whether nation be understood as it should be, as a territory equal to that of the French nation. So, um, yeah, they're, they're laying out the sort of disputes around uh, what is a nation here um, and whether it's, uh, it's about blood relatedness uh, or shared culture and so on. Um, and so you can see that these these discussions, these self conceptions exist right back in the in the 15th century. They also argued interestingly that a, a nation transcends the boundaries of dynastic rule, and I, th I think they used the example of of Spain, where there was different um, monarchies, but they were arguing that there was a there was obviously a, a nation that sort of transcended those individual monarchies, and they said that nations in a general council should be considered equal, and each should have the same rights. Gatt says it's difficult to imagine more impressive evidence for the national question in medieval Europe. Um, so, as I say, the majority of medieval historians are very much on, on the, the thesis of, of medieval nationalism existing. But the multi ethnic universalist empire has been taken as the form of pre modern states by modernists and traditionalists alike, as I said earlier. Now, I'm using traditionalists here not to mean that in the context of debates around nationalism, that a traditionalist in that debate says that nationalism has always been around. But of course, you have these more um, religious traditionalists that argue that nationalism is um, this very bad effect of modernity. But he says, quote, the great, major, uh, the great majority of empires were both national and multinational, and there was no necessary contradiction between the two. Empire's multinationalism was inclusive, but also graduated and hierarchic, with an imperial people or ethnos at its center. All the other peoples collaborated with and were co-opted into the empire in recognition of this fact and the underlying balance of power. Um, so this adds a lot of necessary nuance to the debate around nationalism. Like, okay, so 
you know, maybe states didn't exist. It was like 99% German or 99% French or whatever. And okay, there's multi-ethnic empires, but you can't say that the ethnic element, the national element was just uh, irrelevant on that basis, because as he says, oftentimes in the, in most cases, actually, there's still a conception that yes, it's a multi-ethnic empire, but this is the German multi-ethnic empire. This is the French multi-ethnic empire, right? That there's still a nation building people that's at the center and that's it's still kind of in their service and that the, the other ethnic groups are ultimately kind of subservient to that group. Now there are exceptions and that's basically what modernists and traditionalists will, will super focus on is like the Habsburg empire. And this has distorted scholarly perception and it gets misrepresented as the norm. Um, the number of political units in Europe has shrunk since 1500 from some 500 to around 25. And through this process, it was national states which exhibited remarkable resilience. So again, if the, you know, if the contention of the, the instrumentalists is it's all state manufactured, it's all elite top down, well, why did all of these multi-ethnic empires disappear out of existence? And what remains is these core sort of national states of England, France, and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, another blow to the instrumentalists on that point. If nationalism is just this top-down manufactured thing, this kind of managing community, false consciousness, why wasn't there a Habsburg nationalism that lasted past the Habsburg Empire? Why wasn't there an Austro-Hungarian nationalism that lasted past Austria-Hungary? Uh, it's because these imperial identifications couldn't create that long lasting sense of identification because it comes from the ethnic conception. It comes from the ethnic relatedness. It comes from the kinship and, and the culture that's kind of organically developed there. Um, so yeah, it totally blows out the, the instrumentalist thesis. And this is a quote from Susan Reynolds, who is, is quite a influential uh, medieval historian um, from the book Kingdoms and Communities in Western Europe. Um, she says on uh, the medieval period, a kingdom was never thought of as merely the territory which happened to be ruled by a king. It comprised and corresponded to a people, gens, natio, populus. So much was this taken for granted that learned writers uh, seldom argued about this directly when they discussed political subjects. They merely made remarks which suggested that it was an unreasoned premise of their political arguments. The trouble about all this, the modern theorizing about the nation, for the medieval historian is not that the idea of the permanent and objective real nation is foreign to the Middle Ages, as so many historians of nationalism assume, but that it closely resembles the medieval idea of the kingdom. Um, yeah, an important point, and one that applies not just to the medieval period, but also the ancients. You know, when Aristotle is writing, he's obviously, he's taken for granted that he's, he's talking about a political community of, of a, a gens, a natio, of a people. Um, and yeah, the same the same is true for uh, medieval period. But again, opponents of nationalism will hyperfixate on this and uh, say, look, it's only in the, the 18th century that uh, you get philosophers uh, talking about like the, the ethnic basis for a nation. It's like, yeah, because this was this was taken for granted. Um, now, it's important, of course, in all of this to discuss how modernity and nationalism do interface. Because, you know, is Gat just this, is Gat just this guy that's saying that like nationalism always existed as it did now and uh, nothing changed and the history is just this conflict between national groups? No, of course not. You know, there were more multi-ethnic empires. There was less a conception of, you know, a state being run um, in this sort of homogeneous way or like the, the ethnic group as the basis for, for sovereignty. Of course, there are big changes that happen in modernity. Um, and as mentioned, you know, this is significant that the masses become more con concentrated in cities. And a result of that, popular sovereignty becomes the basis for state legitimacy. So whatever people say, past a certain point, the Industrial Revolution, Enlightenment, whatever kind of state it was, at a certain point, people begin to appeal to it on the basis that it serves the people, whether that's uh, communism, or uh, nationalism or whatever, it, it, everything becomes uh, reduced in the end to an appeal to this is in the interests of, of the people. 
Um, widespread literacy and improvements in communications technology allowed for the politicization of the masses and nationalism as a principle becomes prominent. So although nationalism existed prior to this, it is only with modernity that it becomes the predominant language of statehood. Quote, the sweeping process of modernization, rather than inaugurating nationalism, simultaneously released, transformed, and enhanced it while greatly increasing its legitimacy. So this is the crucial point um, to understand, as you know, modernists say it's the creation of, of modernity. The key point is that Gatt's thesis, it always existed. There was always a political conception of ethnicity. There was always national states when ethnic group was, was predominant. What changes with modernity is nationalism is basically freed. The energy of nationalism is kind of released in a way that never was before. So modernity is more of a catalyst than um, a cause. Um, and also it becomes the language of statehood. Um, again, this is a result of, of mass culture, widespread literacy that we begin to talk about um, statehood and state formation in the language of nationalism. Um, and how it relates to popular sovereignty is interesting. Rather than creating nationalism, popular sovereignty gave expression to it. National identity was seen as a precondition of popular rule in a country. For example, John Stuart Mill, who, you know, today, uh, liberals, classical liberals that oppose nationalism might quote John Stuart Mill, but people like him and John Locke just presupposed, again, that they were writing for um they were writing for a community that had uh, a common national basis and understanding. Uh, Mill even says free institutions are next to impossible in a country made up of different nationalities. I think Aristotle has a similar quote, but you see stuff like this all over um, classical liberals that would be portrayed as being enemies of nationalism. You know, classical liberals say will say that they oppose nationalism because they oppose all forms of collectivism. But the, the problem is these people that they're appealing to, like Locke and Mill, just take it for granted that uh, their philosophy is for uh, 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 is for national groups um, that are organized politically. Gatt says, notably, while there have been many national states without free government, free government has scarcely existed in the absence of a national community. Um, and in the face of destruction by invasion, the Soviet Union appealed to Russian patriotism, while other ethnic subjects saw it as a chance for national liberation. Uh, so again, you know, when the chips are down, uh, when a state really has to defend itself and defend its legitimacy and inspire people to defend it, what they always sort of go back to the well of is, is nationalism. That's what the Soviet Union did. You know, Ukrainians and um, people in the Baltics and, and Finnish and so on, they, they would take the weakness of the Soviet Union as a chance to revolt against it. Whereas the Russians, there's an appeal to the Russian patriotic spirit there and they see it as defending their nation. So again, regardless of how much Soviet propaganda there was or how long the Soviet Union lasted, they were never able to inculcate a sense of Soviet nationalism um, because there's no ethnic, you know, there isn't the ethnic basis for that. As soon as um, nations like Kazakhstan and the Baltic states and so on got a chance for independence on the basis of um, the nations uh, that comprise those units, they, of course, went for it. And um, any kind of Soviet identification quickly, quickly diminished. If there's a Soviet nationalism today, it's really just a Russian nationalism that's um, kind of uh, nostalgic. But uh, yeah, these, these larger Yugoslav or, or Soviet states, they could never command that kind of um, self-identification. Uh, and if manipulation by elites is the cause of nationalism, why did no imperial nationalism emerge in Europe? Uh, to quote Gat, the slightest crack in the imperial wall of suppression was sufficient to spark nationalist eruptions and political secessionism, even though the leaders of the national movements lacked all the above instruments of state power. And that's a, another point is when you see the emergence of, of nationalisms uh, against empire, like Greek nationalism against the Ottoman Empire, or Serb nationalism. Oftentimes it's not that, you know, these nationalisms are just getting manufactured in the 17th or 18th or 19th century or whatever, but it's more technological changes is, is making it more difficult for these larger multi-ethnic empires to rule. And so um, these nationalisms get a better chance to emerge, which again, brings us back to the point that modernity is, is a catalyst rather than a cause of nationalism, that these changes in technology Rather than create nationalism, they free it up. They give it a chance to assert itself by military means, you know, in, in revolt, uh, 
against the larger empire. You know, you can think of like the, the sort of guerrilla uh, warfare tactics that the, the IRA pioneered against the British Empire that probably wouldn't have been possible in, in previous centuries. Um, so again, it's it's taking something that's primal, that's primordial, um, but it, it gets a chance to release itself in a new way with modernity. So in conclusion, uh, Gatt says, although radically transformed and enhanced by modernity, nationalism, the rough congruence and connection between state culture, people or ethnicity was not invented in the modern era. National states are perennial in history since the beginning of nationhood, uh, statehood rather. Um, modernists have to effectively deny the existence of pre-modern peoples for their arguments to make sense. They have to totally bound up the conception of peoples with the conception of nation state. Um, and so they, yeah, they end up with a very warped reading of history. And the late emergence of states in Northern Europe biases academics. There's all kinds of geographical reasons why Europe was kind of late in, in developing states. But as we saw earlier, if you look at Japan and China, um, these are cases much older than are looked at by modernists um, that really kind of shed their theories apart. And so actually the bias on, on folks in Europe has actually has actually harmed nationalism studies. Ethnicity has always been political because of natural in-group preference. And this is the, the key point is there's a biological com a component to ethnicity. Um, kinship, uh, ethnic favoritism is something that has always existed because we are biological creatures and always will exist. You know, academics never study why is there family favoritism, right? Why if I, uh, you know, why will I, why will someone, um, you know, maybe donate an organ to uh, a close family member to save their life, but not a, a stranger? This is something we don't really think about, but it's obviously the case. And we don't, um, we don't have some great sort of deconstruction of that, that this is some kind of false consciousness developed by elites. Uh, clearly, this is something very primal and primordial. Now, um, kinship um, and a larger group kinship is just the same thing with you know, less a smaller degree of identification um, than immediate family members but it's still the same kind of thing and yet um, academics will never think to look at the biological basis for that because if there's a biological basis it's perennial and if it's perennial then you can't just um, explain away how it's going to disappear with um, uh, revolution of the proletariat or uh, charter on human rights uh, and then you have to kind of change your politics you know maybe then you have to uh, figure out well how if people are always going to be in, in, in conflict over these group differences uh, how do we mediate that in a way that isn't just forcing people um, to pretend they don't exist or um, having a borderless society maybe and then of course um, they, their politics would go in directions that they, they would resist um, and so you can you can see why there's an obvious bias against thinking this way. Um, Pre-modern peoples had mass cultural forms that are overlooked by modernists. That's a, an interesting point that's made by Gat. That um, yeah, it really uh, it makes a lot of sense when you hear it. Of course, um, you can think of a myriad of ways that culture was transmitted by pre-modern peoples, and you can think of uh, plenty of examples of it. You know, in old ancient epics. Um, you know, ancient forms of, of, of theater and dance and song and folk tales and so on. Uh, and just the fact that religion existed at all um, in pre-modernity. I mean, that is a mass cultural form. That is a mass sort of cultural uh, identification. Um, and nationalism, of course, was enhanced by modernity, not created by it. Scholars have seriously, have not seriously investigated kin favoritism and treated it as lacking in legitimacy. And scholars are also biased by their simple dislike and fear of nationalism. Um, this is just, yeah, it's just the, the way academia is. This is, you know, these are intellectual types. They tend to be more cosmopolitan, more liberal. And there's just a general sort of um, distaste for nationalism there that clouds their judgment. Quote, they claim that nations and nationalism are modern constructs invented for ideological purposes. Is itself a modernist, sometimes postmodernist, ideologically constructed concept which requires deconstruction so yeah that is the, the great irony um they talk about the um 
you know, modernists talk about the, the modern construction of nationhood, but really this is a, a purely modern idea and the historical record um, very much says otherwise. So I think Gatt's uh, defense of primordialism is, is basically sound. Um, I think he, he's, he's right that, you know, people like Anthony Smith and the ethno symbolists that argue that states came out of uh, existing ethnic groups, but they never really investigate, well, what was what was ethnicity doing before modernity, right? How did that interface with politics? And they also don't really examine the biological component and some of these ethno symbolists. So it all goes together, the biological component. Um, he doesn't really talk about race. I think that's also relevant to that discussion, but certainly I think bringing in the discussion of that basic socio-biological uh, insight of kin favoritism is, is highly relevant to the debate. And uh, yeah, I think it's, um, it's pretty hard to look back at the historical record uh, and say that there, there aren't uh, national states prior to modernity. Um, and I think he, you know, again, it's really sort of terminological issues and pill pull uh, and Gat does a good job sort of deconstructing all of that. So that's this book. That's another book in the sort of uh, sociology of nationalism studies I'm covering here. And we will actually be discussing this on the book club I've been running for people that are subscribed on Gumroad and subscribes there. That will be on the 14th of August. At, I think um, like eight Ireland UK time, so nine Central European time. And you can join that discussion by signing up for those platforms. If you, I've already sent out the link on Gumroad, but if you sign up and subscribe there, the link will be there. And so you can read this book, you can join the discussion, and we'll have a chat about this. Uh, it should be interesting. We did one a couple of weeks ago with uh, Populist Delusion, Academic Agent, and Premium Press were on. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's helpful to kind of read these books together and um, discuss them. And uh, it's, it's kind of a better way to retain the information is to discuss it with people, like-minded people. So hopefully some of you will sign up for that and join us for discussion of this book on the 14th of August. But for now, uh, that's all. Thank you for tuning in and take care.